What a last few days we have had here at Yellow Creek Baptist Church. Uh, it all got fired up a week ago yesterday when we had our food giveaway. And we fed 610 different families with over 30 food items. We passed out 800 Bibles, 1,500 bottles of vitamins, and 1,500 bags with toothbrush, toothpaste, and dental floss in it. Then last Sunday, those of you in first service may not know this, but last Sunday in second service, we had four different families, not people, families, four different families from the food giveaway come and worship with us in second service. And we had four people to get saved last Sunday. Isn't that great? Amen. Then last Sunday night, I hope you heard about this, Brother Jeff was supposed to kick off our Bible conference. Well, I watched his flight on my computer at home, and I saw that it was running late. And sure enough, at 5.55 last Sunday night, 35 minutes before service was supposed to start, I got a phone call from Brother Jeff and said, Philip, I just landed in Nashville, and there's no way I'm going to make it tonight to the Bible conference. I immediately got in my truck, headed towards the house, and I prayed, Lord, this didn't come as a surprise to you. You're going to have to let me know which sermon that you want me to preach tonight. Which message do you want me to bring? I headed on to my computer, looked over some old messages, and the Lord brought one in particular to my mind. And I stood on the promise of Romans 8, 28, and preached about one more night with the frogs and praise God in His infinite wisdom, we had another seven people to accept Christ last Sunday night. It was amazing. I just stood there in the of what God did. But man, man, Sunday night, the Holy Spirit was so big. I watched the morning. Then finally, Brother Jeff got here on Monday. He took us deep into the Word of God, deeper than many of us have ever been before. And he connected the dots between some different passages of Scripture and the Word of God. And hear me very well. A lot of you have had questions about what he preached on. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Amen. When we dive deeper into the Word of God, questions are a natural byproduct. Listen to me. This morning I'm laying in bed reading my Bible. Aaron's laying in bed reading her Bible. And what does she do? Honey, I don't understand this passage out of 2 Samuel. What does that mean? When we dive deeper into the Word, we're going to have questions. And look, a lot of you have already asked me questions. That's great. If you've got any questions, any questions, I want you to ask me. And together, we'll open up the Scriptures and we'll find the answer that the Lord wants us to receive. So guys, now that the Bible conference is over, the natural question is, now what? Now what? Over the last month, we've fed the multitudes. We've planted the Word of God in their hearts. We've spread the gospel. We've fasted. We've prayed. We've studied God's Word. Now what? As always, we can find the answer to all of life's questions. And the inherent, infallible, 100% accurate, 100% true, 100% reliable, 100% of the time, God's holy Word the Bible. Do you have questions on how to be a good husband? The Bible has the answer. Do you have questions on how to be a good wife? The Bible has the answer. Do you have questions on how to be a good parent? The Bible has the answer. Do you have questions on how to be a good child? The Bible has the answer. Questions about your finances? The Bible has the answer. Questions on how to mend a broken relationship? The Bible has the answer. Questions on how to be a good boss or a good employee? The Bible has the answer. Questions on how to be a good Christian? The the Bible has the answer. Questions on how to handle conflict, the Bible has an answer. And if you have a question and you need help finding the answer, I will be glad to help you find the answer. We just need to know that all the answers to all life's questions are right here in God's holy word, including the answer. Now, brother, turn with me in your copy of the Lord's Word to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. We're going to begin our reading today with verse 11. Luke chapter 19 begin with verse 11. This is the parable of the king's ten servants. This parable is only recorded in the Gospel of Luke. It's not recorded in any of the other Gospels. Now as we read it, you're going to say, oh, Brother Philip, that really sounds familiar. It sounds like the parable of the talents. There are a lot of similarities between this parable. 
in the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, but it's a totally different passage of Scripture. Now, speaking of parables, I want us to all remember what the word parable means. A parable, guys, is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And as Jesus told this parable some 1,900 plus years ago, the disciples that heard it were able to discern the heavenly meaning. And there's a whole lot of heavenly meaning applicable to us some thousands of years later. If you're at Luke chapter 19, verse 11, and ready to read, or would you say amen? Amen. amen? amen. If you don't have your Bible, you can follow along with us on the screen. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds. And he said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him. And they sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, he commanded these servants to be called unto him, to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound has gained ten pounds. He said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over ten cities. The second one came, saying, Lord, thy pound has gained five pounds. And he said, Likewise to him, Be thou also over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have laid up in a napkin. For I feared thee, because thou art an austere man, and thou takest up that thou layest not down, and reapest that thou did not sow. And he said unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest I was an austere man, taking up what I laid not down, reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest not thou money to the bank, that at my coming I might have required my own with usury. And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that has ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he's got ten pounds. For I say unto you, that every one which hath shall be given, and from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from him. Verse 27. But those my enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Father God, I love you so much. And I just want you to get out of my mind, to my mouth, to the hearts of everybody here. Your message for your people from your word on your day. God, this is truly what you want us to do now that the Bible conference is over. We place it in your hands. Save the soul here nearest to the gates of hell. In Jesus' precious name, amen. And the church, as always, I want us to know the context of what we're reading. In the first ten verses of Luke 19, we learn that Jesus had just entered and passed through Jericho. And it's in these ten verses that we have the story of Zacchaeus. Now, hopefully, some of you that have been in church a long time remember the story of Zacchaeus from Bible school. But listen, if you've never heard of Zacchaeus before, listen to me. Here we go. As Jesus is going through Jericho, there's a huge crowd of people all around. It's kind of like what you would expect to see today with a great, big, famous celebrity. And Zacchaeus, who was the head tax collector in Jericho, the chief one, he wanted to see Jesus too. But Zacchaeus had a big problem. He was a little bit of a short fellow. And he couldn't see over the crowd. So Zacchaeus had an idea. He ran on ahead of Jesus in the direction he was going, and he climbed up a tree so he could see him. And as Jesus came to the place where Zacchaeus was, he stopped, and he looked up in that sycamore tree, and he said, Zacchaeus, make haste to come down, for today I must abide in your house. Well, Zacchaeus, guys, he shimmed down that tree headed to his house and made a big feast and a big celebration for Jesus just as he had commanded. Well, guys, this royally hacked off the Pharisees. Oh, my goodness. Why didn't Jesus go home with them instead? This was a sinner, the chief of sinners, a sinful tax collector. Never mind Jesus had already butted heads with the Pharisees. Never mind that... Uh, 
they had tried to get in his way as he tried to minister to others. Never mind that Jesus had a special plan for Zacchaeus that was going to be told over and over and over and over and over for generations to come. So once Jesus got to Zacchaeus' house, we learned something. Zacchaeus gives us some proof, some fruits of his changed life now that he's met Jesus. Look back in uh, chapter 19, verse 8. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've taken anything by any man of false accusation, I restore to him fourfold. Church, Brother Jeff touched on this at the Bible conference, and I won't talk about it right now. I've said this over and over and over again behind this pulpit. You may have walked the aisle, prayed a prayer, filled out a card, and been baptized so many times the fish know you by name. But unless there has been a change in your life, unless there has been a change in your life, there's not been a conversion. The Bible says in Matthew 7, 20, whereby by their fruits you shall know them. In James 2.20, But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Revelation 20.12, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now, friend, don't get confused. <clears throat> We are not saved by our works. Amen. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We are not saved by our works, but our works give clear evidence as to whether we were really saved or not. Yes. So let me just cut to the chase and boil this down in some redneck hillbilly South Montgomery County language so I think you can all understand. If you walk an aisle, pray to prayer, fill out a card, got wet in the water, but there's no change in your life. Instead of walking the road to heaven, you're living like hell. Amen. Instead of planting seeds of goodness and peace, you're raising cattle. Friend, I hate to be the bearer of bad news to you. But you should be in serious doubt over your Amen. salvation. Amen. You should be in serious doubt of your salvation. Praise God, I'm not your final judge, but your final judge sent me here today to give you a warning, a stern warning, that you may have the preacher full, you may have your spouse full, you may have your kids full, but you don't have God full. The last verse of the story of Zacchaeus, verse 10, chapter 19. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. Friends, that's what Jesus is doing this morning. He is seeking you out. He sent this message just for you. He's drawing you to Him through His Holy Spirit. He's turning up the heat in your heart right now. He's throwing a whole truckload of conviction on your life. And He wants you to know, beyond a shadow of doubt, this morning, you're lost. You're lost. You're without Christ. And you're headed straight for the devil's head. But you can be saved this morning. That's right. If you'll just give your heart to Him. Am I reading somebody's mail this morning? Am I reading somebody's mail? That brings us to our passage, verse 11. And as they, they there is the disciples, as they heard these things, what are these things? What Jesus was telling the Zacchaeus about salvation. As they heard these things, he, Jesus, added and spake a parable to them. In other words, guys, he wanted to build on this teaching of salvation, so he gave them this parable, this earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Now, why did he give them this parable at this time? It says right there at the end of verse 11. Because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God should immediately appear. Let me set the stage for you, church. The disciples thought Jesus was going to set up a political 
kingdom. You remember how James and John earlier had asked Jesus to be on his right hand and his left hand when he came into his kingdom? They wanted to be Jesus' as vice president and his secretary of state. They wanted to be large and in charge. They thought Jesus was going to deliver the Jews from the Romans and to set up his political kingdom. And when that happened, all of the disciples thought that they would have a special place in command. And they knew if Jesus was going to do this, it would happen in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the center of political activity. And since Jesus was now on his way to Jerusalem, since he was almost at the city limits, they thought, hmm, this kingdom is about to happen right now. Now, let me parallel verse 11 in the Bible to today. Just like the disciples in Jesus' day, we think the kingdom of God could immediately appear. Now, unlike the disciples, we know he's not setting up a political kingdom, but a spiritual kingdom. Nonetheless, we believe that this kingdom of God could immediately appear. If you were here at the Bible conference, you heard Brother Jeff say that all of the signs of the times point to the second coming of Christ. And we know that the second coming of Christ happens at least seven years after the rapture of the church. Brother Jeff talked to us about it, and I've said it many times. The rapture of the church could happen at any moment, at any time. Right now, it could happen today. And friends, if these signs of the times that we see, earthquakes in diverse places, famines, pestilences, wars and rumors of wars, as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Lot, if all of these signs of the times point to something that's at least seven years away, how close are we to the rapture? We are standing on the brink of the greatest event in the history of mankind. That's not the only parallel in the church. Let's talk about Jerusalem. You want to know what all of this fighting is going on in Jerusalem and in that part of the world today over that one little spot of ground? You want to know why ISIS and Hamas and Iran they all have their sights squarely on Jerusalem because everybody knows from the staunchest Christian to the staunchest Muslim that Jerusalem is where all of those end time events are going to take place. And these people think wrongly that if they can control Jerusalem, they can control the end of time. But oh how wrong they are, guys. Instead of, instead of controlling things, they're doing nothing more than fulfilling promises. Amen. Amen. That's right. Friends, the parallels in verse 11 and the rest of this passage are no accident. If there ever was a timely word in the Bible for Christians today, what we are reading is it. Look at verse 12. He said, Therefore a certain nobleman went to a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. Now notice Jesus here, guys, said a certain nobleman he didn't say a man, he said a noble man. What's the difference between a common man and a noble man? His royal birth. That's the difference. The term nobleman designates that unlike the common man, this person had a royal birth. Alrighty, who's the nobleman in verse 12? Jesus. Jesus. That's right. It's Jesus. He's the nobleman. Unlike me and you, he had a royal birth that we're going to celebrate in just a few days. Now, his royal birth wasn't what we would necessarily consider a royal birth today with lots of pomp and circumstance. The Bible says that Jesus was born in a lowly manger because there was no room for him in the inn. Uh, he wasn't born in the finest hospital known to man with throngs of media standing outside waiting to take a picture. His birth was attended by his mother, her fiancé, some farm animals. And later on that night, some shepherds that were in the field keeping watch over their flocks by night. But guys, what made the birth of Jesus royal was not the factors surrounding his birth. It was the fact that his father was heavenly and he facilitated a birth through a virgin girl named Mary. His mother was a peasant, but praise God, his father was a king. Amen. Verse 12 goes on to say that this nobleman, Jesus, had to go to a far country and then return. 
The Bible says this is exactly what Jesus has done. In fact, Jesus himself talks about this very thing in John 14, 3. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Right. Church, we know from the Holy Scriptures that 40 days after Jesus' resurrection, He ascended back into heaven. And the Bible tells us in this very context, Acts chapter 1, while they, the disciples, looked steadfastly toward heaven as He went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which said, Ye men of Galilee, while stand ye here gazing up into heaven, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen Him go into heaven. Church, Jesus may have entered this earth some 2,000 years ago. He may have left it some 33 years later. But make no mistake, He ain't gone for good. Amen. He's coming back and He will return. As John the Revelator said, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. That leads us to verse 13. He called His ten servants. He delivered them ten pounds and He said, Occupy till I come. Before this nobleman left, he called his ten servants together and he gave them ten pounds, one pound per person. There's a great significance here in the number ten. The number ten in scriptures is the number of divine order. The Lord has divinely ordered every one of his servants, every one of his children. That's us, the Christian. He has divinely ordered and given us everything we will ever need to occupy Amen. until He comes. Now when we hear the word occupy, this is what we think. We think about occupying a seat or taking up a place. That is not what the word occupy means here. If you have a different translation than the King James translation, you may see that that word occupy means to trade or to do business with. In other words, Instead of having places of privilege in the kingdom of God, we're being instructed to do business with the talents that the Lord gives us in order to increase His kingdom. We're to do business with the talents and the abilities the Lord gives us in order to increase His kingdom. Now guys, this is not a concept just found here in Luke 19. Look at Acts 1.8. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. 1 Peter 4.10 As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. In other words, church, <clears throat> once we give our hearts to Christ, we're not instructed just to sit on the pew and serve. Right, right. We're commanded to stand and serve. Lord. We're to use the talents and the power He's given us through the Holy Spirit. And we're to use this to help increase the kingdom of God. To bring others to Christ. And one day, we are going to have to give an account of what we did with the power and the talents the Lord gave us. Look at verse 15. It came to pass that when He was returned, having received the kingdom, that He commanded these servants to be calling to Him to whom He had given the money, that He might know how much every man had gained by trading. Brother Jeff touched on this scripture on Monday night. There's two judgments mentioned in Scripture, church. There's two. There's the great white throne judgment in Revelation 20. You've heard me preach on that message before. The great white throne judgment is the judgment for the lost sinners without Christ. But there's also another judgment. There's the judgment seat of Christ. And the Christian will experience the judgment seat of Christ. Look at Romans 14.10. Why dost thou judge thy brother? Why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Right. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Right. Christians, you listen to me. At the judgment seat of Christ, Christians, we are going to have to stand before Jesus. We're going to have to give an account of what we did or what we didn't do with the talents and the opportunities that God gave us. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. 
This past Wednesday night, <clears throat> little Ben Moore was sick. And his mother, Julie, had to stay home with Ben. And Julie's our treasurer. So Julie sent two checks with her husband Shane to give me to pay our babysitters that keep our little kids at special events and evening services. Well, I was sitting there in the office with the two babysitters, and I was writing their checks out, and I, as I was writing out their checks, the Holy Spirit very clearly laid it on my heart that I needed to share the gospel with these two ladies. So I explained to them what had been going on during our Bible conference and what they had been keeping our kids for. And I asked if either one of them had been saved. And the first lady raised her, told me, she said, yes, Brother Philip, I was saved at a youth retreat several years ago. And the second young lady looked at me and said, I don't have a blessed clue what you're talking about. So friend, right there, I just shared with her how since the beginning of time, Adam and Eve, man is a sinner. We're born in a sinner. And that sin causes a separation between us and Holy God Almighty in heaven. And I told him how Jesus, God's Son, came from heaven to earth and lived a perfect life to be that sacrifice for our sin, to make payment for our sin, and to make the only way that we can ever get to heaven to be with God forever. And I shared with her how we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. A, B, C. A, admit that we're sinners. B, believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sin. C, confess Him as Lord and Savior of your life. And then I told her, I said, now look, you don't have to do this on Sunday morning. You can do this at any time. In fact, if you'd like to ask Jesus into your heart right now, you can do it. She said, Brother Philip, I'd love to do that. And so Wednesday night, after everybody had left, sitting in my office, I led a young lady to the Lord. After that, I started talking to her about what do we do now that we've given our hearts to Christ. I talked to her about growth, going to church, G, R, reading your Bible, O, obeying what it says, W, witnessing. And I talked to her about how one of the ways we witness is through baptism. And both of those ladies, the, the one lady, girl, of course, had never been baptized, and the other one that had been saved, spoke up and said, Brother Philip, I've never been baptized. So ladies and gentlemen, we're going to end up baptizing both of those girls. Yes, yes. Amen. Now, how many times, the, what, what just happened? What happened Wednesday night church was wonderful. Oh, it was great. It was great. I was fired up. But how many times, ladies and gentlemen, have I been in that exact same situation? I felt led to ask somebody about their salvation. And I didn't do it. That's right. That's right. At the judgment seat of Christ, not only am I going to have to give an account of the good, like this past Wednesday night, I'm going to have to give an account of the bad. You see, guys, the Lord didn't give us the power of the Holy Spirit and these talents and these abilities and these opportunities. He didn't give those to us to use for our personal benefit. That's right. He gave them to use for kingdom benefit. One day, you and I Amen. are going to have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And we're going to have to give an account that's what we did with what the Lord gave us. So judgment day comes, and the nobleman's servants have to give an account. Verse 16. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound has gained ten pounds. Notice in verse 16, he said, thy pound. Not my pound. Thy pound. Everything we get, every talent, every ability, every opportunity comes from God. It's not our talent. It's the Lord's talent. It's not our power, it's the Lord's power. James 1, 17. Every good and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. Now look at the nobleman's response to his first servant, verse 17. He said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have authority over ten cities. Notice this servant's reward. There's two parts to the reward, church. First, is the commendation by the nobleman where he says, well, 
thou good servant. Now that's really similar to what was said in the parable of the talents where he said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Church, let me just tell you. <clears throat> let me just tell you. Cut to the chase. I'm looking forward to going deer hunting tomorrow. Of all the days of the year my wife chooses to go to Jackson, she chose the opening day of gun season. I'm looking forward to going deer hunting tomorrow. I'm looking forward to celebrating my birthday next Sunday. I'm looking forward to celebrating my anniversary on December the 19th. I'm looking forward to celebrating Christmas with my family and friends. But make no mistake, ladies and gentlemen, more than all of those things put together, I am really, 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 really looking forward to the day that I get to see my Savior, Jesus Christ, face to face. And he says, well done, Philip Chambers. You've done a good job with the power and the talents and the abilities and the opportunities that I gave you. Friends, I appreciate your compliments. Listen, when you tell me the music and the message was good, thank you. We all love to receive compliments. Let's be honest with ourselves. But the compliment that I'm looking forward to far and away the most is the one that I hope to receive from Jesus Christ one day when he says, well done. Amen. Are you looking forward to that day? Amen. Now notice, notice the second part of the reward. Not only did this servant receive a compliment, he also received authority over ten cities. This is a direct parallel to what we're going to receive as our reward. The Bible says in several different places that one day we will reign with him. Revelation 20 verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that has the first part in the res first resurrection. And on such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. 2 Timothy 2.12 If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Church, when we do the Lord's will, when we occupy, when we use the talents and the abilities and the power and the opportunities that the Lord gives us, when we use all of that to increase the kingdom of God, the Lord, the Lord not only gives us a compliment at the judgment seat of Christ, but he gives us authority in his kingdom. The second servant comes to the nobleman of verse 18. The second came saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said, Likewise to him beat thou also over five cities. <coughs> this servant made five pounds, but the nobleman's one pound. So he was given authority over five cities. What does this teach us? This teaches us that everybody, although everybody gets equipped and empowered by the same Holy Ghost, not everybody has the same yield right. or the same outcome or the same increase for the kingdom of God. And in addition, our authority at the judgment seat is going to be proportional to what we're doing, what we do with the abilities the Lord gives us. That's right. For example, how many millions of cities is Billy Graham going to have authority over? <laughs> millions! He's going to be authority over millions of cities. Somebody like myself, I'm going to receive authority over just a few. But regardless, church, listen to me. This is a fact jack with my hand up. I want to receive as much authority as I possibly can at the judgment seat. I want to do as much as I possibly can with the talents, the abilities, the power, and the opportunities that the Lord has given me. I'm going to do exactly what Jesus commands us to do in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, where thieves do not break through or steal. For where your treasure is, there shall your heart be also. Yeah, that's right. Ladies and gentlemen, where's your treasure? If your treasure's in the bank, the backyard, the bedroom, or the basement, it can be gone. Right. Just like that. Amen. But when we lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven, by increasing the kingdom of God, no thief will ever steal those treasures away. Where are you laying up your treasures? 
The next servant laid his up in a nap. Verse 20. Another came saying, Lord, behold, here's thy pound which I have kept laid up in a napkin. For I feared thee, because thou art an austere man. Thou takest up that thou layest not down, thou reapest thou that thou did not sow. Church, we have a choice. We don't have to use the abilities God's given us to build a kingdom. We can choose to do nothing with it. That's what this servant does. And he had to give an account of what he had done. And when he had to give that account, oh my goodness, here comes the excuses. As I've preached before, church, there, are, there is not an excuse for failing to serve the Lord. Amen. We've been clearly commanded. We've been more than adequately equipped. It's just a function of laziness and apathy Amen. that keeps us from using the talents, the abilities, the power, and the opportunities that the Lord gives us to build His kingdom. Are you lazy? Are you lazy? Do you give a flying hairy rip as to whether the kingdom of God increases? Are you choosing to not use and make the most of the talents, the abilities, the power, and the opportunity that the Lord gives you? If you make that choice, there's consequences. Verse 22. He, the nobleman, said unto him, the servant, Out of thy own mouth I will judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knowest I was an austere man, taken up that I laid not down, reaping what I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest thou not my money to the bank, that at my coming I might have required my own with usury. And he said unto him that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that has ten pounds. Just like our reward comes in two parts, the consequences of doing bad comes in two parts. First, instead of getting a compliment, you're getting a condemnation. Instead of saying, well done, the Lord says, thou wicked servant. And secondly, church, instead of receiving authority, we'll actually forfeit and lose the authority the Lord wanted to give us. The Apostle Paul tells us this very thing in 1 Corinthians 3.15. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet is so by fire. In other words, if at the judgment seat of Christ, you have nothing of value to show Jesus. You did nothing with the talents, the abilities, the power, and the opportunities that he gave you. You will suffer loss. You will lose and forfeit the authority that he wanted to give you. Now you won't lose your life. You won't go to hell. But you will lose the authority that the Lord wanted to give you. So here's the question. Where does that authority go? Well it says there at the end of verse 24. It goes to the servant that has 10 pounds. Now the people didn't understand this. Verse 25 they said. Lord he's got 10 pounds already. Look what Jesus explained in verse 26. For I say unto you that unto every one which hath shall be given. From him that hath not, even he that hath shall be taken away from him. Let me cut to the chase. You don't use it, you're going to lose it. If you don't use it, you're going to lose it. And the Lord's going to give your talents and your abilities and your power and your opportunity to somebody that will use it for the benefit of the king. Can I call a time? I'm going to share my heart with them something. I believe that we as a church have received many opportunities for ministry because other churches have forfeited. Right. King Solomon says there's nothing new under the sun. So the opportunities that we receive here at Yellow Creek are not unique opportunities to us. They were opportunities that other churches and other people had. But instead of using those opportunities as a chance to increase the kingdom of God, these other people and these other churches decided, we're just going to be lazy. We're just going to make sure we got enough money in the bank and we're not going to do anything. So the Lord took that opportunity from them and He gave it to Yellow Creek because He knows if we thought we could increase the kingdom of God by hosting a hog killing, we'd do it. That brings us to the last verse. Verse 27. But before you get to verse 27, James, go back over a verse that we skipped over. Verse 14. 
his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. Right. The nobleman's people didn't want him reigning over them. Right. Same thing happened to Jesus, his very own people. The Jews, they didn't want him reigning over them. Same thing happens today. Some of you in this room, many others listening by way of radio, you decide that you want to live life your way instead of letting Jesus reign over your life. Right. That's your choice. That's your choice. Christ gives us the freedom and the liberty to choose how we want. But as with all choices, there's a consequence. Here's the consequence, verse 27. But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. That's right. My friend, if you make the choice to not let Christ reign in your life, here's the consequence. If the rapture takes place before you die, you're going to be left behind to endure the worst day in the history of the world. As hundreds of planes fall from the sky, millions of cars crash, thousands of houses catch fire, and the entire civilized world spins into utter chaos. Not only that, you'll have to endure all the plagues and all the judgments detailed in Revelation. And if, during the Great Tribulation, you do choose to follow Christ, you will be martyred for your faith. <laughs> If you choose to not allow Christ to reign over you and you die before the rapture takes place, instead of your eternal destiny being where I'm going, the paradise and perfection of heaven, your eternal destiny is the lake of fire. Right. Where you will live in torture, torments, pains, and chains forever. There's only two consequences, two consequences of your choice to reject Christ today. So let's go back to the question I asked at the beginning of the message. Now, what are you going to do now that the Bible conference is over? To the saved people that are here, are you going to use your talents the Lord's given you to increase the kingdom of God? Are you going to use them for the benefit of the Lord? Realizing that He could rapture us away at any moment in time? Are you laying up for yourselves treasures in heaven? Do you want the Lord to look you in the eye one day and say, Well done? Amen. And for those of you here today who are lost without Jesus Christ, and I believe with all of my heart that we have some in a crowd of size. For those of you that have never accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, for those of you that want to live your life your way instead of the Lord's way, I've presented you your future. Verse 27 shows your destruction and your death. My friend, the consequences of, accepting, of not accepting Christ are too risky and too great. You are standing on the brink of not having another chance. Give your heart to Jesus today. All salvation is available to you. 